during humanitarian crisis, as an external um, organization responding to a crisis, you're likely to get caught up in the dilemma of when do I use top down and bottom up to the greatest extent possible, minimize uh, top down. Allow yourself to study and understand the community, understand the factors driving them away, if it's a situation of displacement or refugeehood, um, understand the context. But also, in my experience, the few times we've used top down has been very, very minimal. For example, when we want to screen, a lot of the work we do is identifying survivors of, of violence, torture, and supporting them overcome the trauma and traumatic experiences they might have encountered. And so, in that situation, it is inevitable that you would have to do some screening, some specialized screening to be able to isolate who is at most need of a service, for example, who is most distressed. And that's the only time in our program, for example, that we would use uh, a top-down approach. Thereafter, once we identify and know uh, this category of people needs this kind of support, all we do is link them to services and they keep coming back to us. We make ourselves available for them to come back to consult us. They, in, in, entering into a community is a massive challenge in a humanitarian context. If you take an example of, uh, of refugees, for example, the South Sudan refugee context, they are in a new land, they don't speak the language, they don't understand uh, the environment. We've had situations where mothers are very worried about their children getting lost. These camps are experts of land. They're like national parks in some ways, where you walk and there's no clear footpath leading you to a particular place. And so when you're working within that kind of environment, you know, first of all, understand the geographical context, understand the context in which these people are working, and have a clear service map on who is doing what. But allow yourself to learn from the existing communities. They know the environment a lot more. And they'll have a natural instinct to come out and survive and adapt to the local environment. So even the, the adaptation to the local environment, uh, in our case, is community-driven. It's driven by the individuals through inquiry, inquiring, consulting them. How are you, simple questions such as, how are you adapting to this environment? That question alone will elicit numerous responses, but those responses are extremely helpful in shaping your uh, bottom-up approach. If a community comes up, if an individual comes up and says, you know, I'm not adapting well, and mothers tell us this, every time my children go out, I worry that they're not going to come back, that they are lost, they don't know where to go. So I take that information and work with a different camp management system to be able to ensure that there are different reporting points. If a child is lost, if a young girl hasn't come back home, where is the nearest point of call that a mother can go and report such an incident? But bottom-up bottom up approaches are taking ground. I think we've seen in the more recent uh, child-focused programs, more agencies uh, learning and adapting bottom-up approaches, including reducing the number of external workers and external, I don't mean uh, expatriates, external could even be a local uh, person working in the same environment. But among the refugees, there are lots of skills that they possess. You have teachers who can do translation for you. So other than employing a social worker who doesn't speak the local language, and then I employ a translator and then I employ a guide who is familiar with the local environment. Nowadays, I use a lot more of the local people. We find teachers, we find social workers. They are quite familiar with the language. They are quite familiar with the context of operation and they understand the social norms and the culture. Uh, for me as an organization, uh, that cuts back on my overhead costs. It also makes my program quite responsive to the local community and household needs. And it allows me to engage freely with the community because I'm putting their own people at the front of responding to uh, the humanitarian crisis. Sometimes the, the, the context of humanitarian work is non-homogeneous. You have a diversity of culture, different social norms, 
different practices and values. In the context of community systems strengthening, it's important to allow yourself time to understand these different uh, cultures, social norms and practices, and to what extent are they harmful to children. I wouldn't attempt to go in and change them directly. First of all, you won't have enough time to change. Some crises are short, others are much more protracted. But how they engage the custodians of these practices directly? The custodians of these practices usually emerge naturally. In a situation of displacement, you naturally get leaders. Even before we external agencies come, you will find the, the community is already organizing itself to respond. Either they are seeking for a service already, you will find them at a local health center, you will find them uh, innovating, looking for a service, looking for uh, uh, materials to construct their houses, taking care of themselves. And that is important to allow that to continue. And identifying who is leading this process. Is it the clan leader? Is it the women leaders? The moment you identify them, then it helps a lot to, to understand what kind of protective uh, factors are they dealing with, what are the risks, and how do these align to their belief system, their values and social norms. And so it, it eventually you end up with different concentrations of practices across very non-homogeneous communities that might be living in the same geographical location. And eventually those become your units in the system. So just as you say, I have a health center here, I have a school here, I have a probation service here, say I have this particular group of clan leaders here, then I have another group of traditional leaders here, then I have another group of women leaders here who are responding to these issues. And then you begin engaging them on issues of principle and issues of do no harm. And you're just talking to them and raising, continually raising awareness and allowing them to go out and talk. So these different clan leaders, traditional leaders, should be your emissaries and connectors to the wider community. They will go out and speak on your behalf. We are getting to a level where now we are pulling back. We are just facilitators. And for me, system strengthening work should be facilitated by an external person. We shouldn't lead the system strengthening. We should pick out the gaps based on the common principles we are aware of. The one I keep going to is do no harm, best interest of the child. We may not even understand what the best interest of the child is in the, in the context of non-homogeneous communities. We have always said the best interest of the child is a family. But these are non-homogeneous communities. But they will tell you, and they are self-regulated. They will lead you to what they think is the best interest of the child. So you're safeguarding, you're creating safeguards, and you're facilitating the process. And then you're reporting on the whole transformation of the system that you're trying to set up. But you're involving them, these community leaders, have to be at the formal, uh, at the forefront. And that's the connection for me between the formal and informal begins to happen there. The way I look at uh, a child protection system, even in humanitarian settings, you have to recognize it has to be role specific. You look at the different functions of uh, the church. The church is extremely important. And when I travel in the settlements in Northern Uganda, the South Sudanese settlements, Every second block is a church, a makeshift church. But these are places of congregation, not only a prayer congregation, places of meeting and interaction. And you just have to go on and sit and listen to the kind of conversations they have. They actually talk about community issues. So as external people, we need to find the, 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 the strength in us to be able to go in, the humility to be able to go in and sit when these groups are having their conversations. And then that's where you identify the leaders. So your local church, however makeshift it is, becomes uh, part of your informal community system. The leadership structure, the clan leaders, the women leaders, but they are also youth leaders. The most affected, uh, affected uh, population segment are the youth, children and women. 
and those you'll find, you'll find groups of youth. Unfortunately, these youth are very idle because they don't have anything going for them. But they are extremely resourceful as far as leading you to, to other things.